Hello, I'm Gavin Clark, a managing editor of Situation Publishing, parent uh, publication to the Register. And I'm here with Paul Robichaud, uh, who's Chief Technology Officer of Office 365 Migration Management Specialist, Quadritech. And we're going to discuss that thorniest of topics, the subject that never goes away, it has more installments than Game of Thrones, Microsoft licensing. And we're going to put that in the context of Office 365 as well. Now, we're going to have a little Q&A here today. And we're going to do, this should be of interest to anybody who is either moving to Office 365 from on-prem, or particularly people who are moving between uh, tenants. And we know there's a lot of that going on right now because people are most, well, mostly, a lot of people are in the cloud already. And now we're talking to second phase of Office 365. And what we're going to discuss in particular are um, the hidden licensing costs and some of the gotchas in Office 365 licensing. And we'll look at what you need to know and what you should not never assume about Office 365 licensing, because that's what's going to catch you out. And we will drill down into some specific Office 365 apps, some of which you won't find in the on-prem version of Office. And also we'll look at uh, mobile, because obviously everything's mobile these days as well. Now, Paul's filled in a lot of questions over the years uh, from a lot of customers, and he's uh, got a lot of experience in this field. And he's going to, uh, we're going to channel some of that, distill some of that into a few uh, pointed questions that he seems to be answered a lot and every day. And hopefully he'll provide you with some answers and much needed guidance in this field. And we will discuss also a new product which Quadratech has released uh, to help you administer and manage some of this complexity away, which I think is going to be really interesting as well. I hope so. Yeah. So before we, before we go any further, let's, let's talk a little, bit, a little bit scene setting, obviously. Uh, now, we were told by the people of Silicon Valley that cloud was going to make everything simpler. And there's no much more complex place than uh, enterprise software licensing. And when cloud came along, people told us it will make software licensing easier. It will remove the complexity, swipe a credit card, and you'll just pay a renewable fee, and that'll be it. But of course, it didn't work out that way, did it? And the problem or the challenge, rather, with enterprise licensing of software is, in particular, that if you get it wrong, you'll pay a lot of money. And well. if you get it wrong, you'll pay a lot of money and be audited by the vendor, which is never a pleasant experience for anybody, uh, except the lawyers, of course. Now, Paul, on the Quadratech site, you've referred to something called the quagmire of administration when it comes to licensing. Maybe you could just explain that a little bit for me. What do you mean by that? So quagmires are swampy, yucky places where nobody wants to go, right? And licensing falls into that same category. When you think about what it means to license Office 365, it's tempting to drink Microsoft's Kool-Aid and say, oh, as you mentioned before, people think of cloud licensing the way that you license Netflix. You pay X dollars a month and the cost is always predictable, it's always transparent, and it scales perfectly to however many users you have. You add one user, you add one license. But in the enterprise world, that's not what happens because Office 365 licensing is part of the bigger picture of licensing servers and licensing CALs and buying connectors and SQL Server Enterprise cores and all these other things that Microsoft sells. So for a 10-person company that's just buying Office 365 on the web, they can swipe their credit card and they know exactly what their monthly spend will be. For a Boeing or a Ford or Royal Mail or the, the NHS, or you, you name the enterprise, their licensing model is not at all like that. It's completely different. And Microsoft has a lot of ability to play the car dealer game and say, well, I'm going to lower the cost of this thing without telling you maybe I'm going to sneak the cost up a little bit here. I'm going to remove a license benefit that you used to have. And so keeping track of that is just devilishly hard. And then you have the added complexity, I suppose, of the uh, for the end user, you can swipe your card. So before you know it, you've got a little bit of shadow IT creeping in, haven't you? Absolutely. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, um, I suppose, some of the, uh, there's kind of four real um, challenges, I suppose, uh, which, which which kind of creep in with Office 365 licensing. And one is just the just for, I suppose, newbies coming to the field, if those guys still exist, is the new way of licensing, the new way of calculating that cost versus the old prom the old on premises world, isn't it? And that, that kind of that's one area of challenge for people. It's it's very difficult to estimate what you're going to spend on the cloud in a lot of ways. And this whole industry has sprung up around cost containment or cost accounting for the cloud compute services. So for Azure and AWS or any number of companies that will sell you products and say, oh, well, if you're spending X dollars, you can reduce that to some smaller number by doing these things. But for office licensing, there's really no practical way to do that because in the same way that if you and I both buy the same flights on British Airways or Delta or whatever, we might pay completely different ticket prices for the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the airline doesn't want you and I talking and say, hey, Gavin, how much did you pay for your flight? Well, you paid that much? Wow, I got ripped off. They don't want office customers doing that. But because office licensing is just one piece of that whole um, buffet of different license options, uh, it, it's almost impossible to predict 
what your office licensing costs will look like as part of that whole. Um, and you, there's not really any basis for comparison between customers and between tenants. And that's a good point. And, and then adding further layer is like pass. We, the popular phrase these days is four dimensional chess. We use that a lot at the moment. Um, adding another, the second layer to that four dimensional chess is um, the whole idea you've got different functionality in Office 365 on, uh, versus on prem. So if, if on prem is your Oyster, um, it's going to change by the time you get to cloud because you've got this new functionality to license out as well, haven't you? You do, because if you think about a typical company, the typical companies that we deal with have already got investments in on premises AD, on premises exchange. Maybe they have SharePoint, maybe not. And they're moving to, or they have moved to the cloud, but they still have some resources on-prem. So now you have all the costs for all that on-prem environment. Those licenses were purchased. They may eventually have to be renewed, even if you have software assurance. So that's one pool of cost. Now, every time you pluck a user out of that on-prem pool and you move her to the cloud, now you've incurred an additional cost. Mm -hmm. You may be paying the full cost of a license. You may get a discount or some kind of free usage benefit. Whatever benefit you get may be permanent, it may be limited time. These are the kinds of, of levers that Microsoft can adjust to yeah. control what the overall cost looks like. Um, but then you also have to consider that there are many things that exist in the cloud that may be licensed and don't have on-prem counterparts. So for example, let's say that I, I've swallowed a pitcher full of the Kool-Aid. I've moved all my on-prem users completely to Office 365 using the, the E3. SKU, which is fairly common. Mm. And then Microsoft comes along and says, you know, if you upgrade to E5, you get these security benefits, you get this, 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 and this. Well, now I'm in a bit of a conundrum. I have to decide, is the increased functionality that I get from that SKU worth the extra money? Well, I don't know. There are no counterparts. I can't go buy an on-premises mm. product that replaces that functionality. So I don't really have anything to compare it against. And when you can't understand what the cost comparison looks like, it's really difficult to put a value or put a price tag on what you're giving. Now, you, everyone wants new functionality, and then they kind of think about the, 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 the pain for it kind of afterwards. I mean, Mike's is great at setting the business case for this right. stuff, isn't it? Um, another, the third, the third layer, I suppose, in this four-dimensional uh, game of chess is you're changing the way you're paying. I mean, you're, you're moving from this recurring familiar model, which might have been expensive up front, to this supposedly lower cost combination of like... Um, of ongoing costs and, and and it wasn't even like with on-prem you just paid your one-off license as we all know and I'm probably uh, telling people they know all you know here but because you had that, that kind of complexity of the the cow the enterprise license right. you mentioned two there already the client server the client license the server license you I mean the stuff was never complicated on premises and that kind of stuff has shifted to the cloud too so microsoft again has a lot of knobs and levers that they can adjust to control that. And one way that they do that is by, uh, th they do two different kinds of bundling. So mm -hmm. they bundle down and they bundle up. Yeah. What I mean by that is they take features sometimes that are introduced at a high level Cal, like in the, the E5 Cal, and then they make that available to lower SKUs. So if you've already bought the E3 SKU for your users, at some point Microsoft may uh, give you a benefit and they may say, oh, we're going to move this feature down to the less expensive SKU. Right. Well, now you've just gotten, I don't want to say for free, You've gotten an additional blob of value that didn't cost you any extra, but that may be reflected in an increased license price the next time you mm -hmm. renew. So you essentially are getting something for free for now that may cost you later. The other thing that they do is they're always trying to put a new layer on top of the stack and have a new sort of you know super premium version that has everything in it. So back in the day, we had E3, then Microsoft added E5. Then they added uh, Enterprise Management and Security, EMS. Then they added Microsoft 365. So you can imagine that at some point in the, the glorious future, there will be like a Microsoft 365 Platinum Pro uh, Super Plus edition or something that has a bunch of SKUs that right now are sold and costed separately. Mm -hmm. The problem is when you bundle those together, it's really difficult to decide, okay, am I going to save money if I buy, let's say, E3 plus Teams phone system plus domestic calling? Is that more expensive or less expensive than buying an E5? Uh, and is it more expensive or less expensive to get this phone plan versus that phone plan? It's really tricky to come yeah. up with accurate estimates there. Yeah. And I suppose finally, and this is where it kind of really kicks in, is another the, the final layer in the, this four-dimensional game of chess is the um, some of the drivers that are causing complexity is tenant-to-tenant -tenant migration. So let's assume you've got all that sorted right. out. Suddenly your company's engaging in the bout of M&A or you're setting up new divisions. Um, you're buying people, suddenly you have to rationalize 
these two separate Office 365 estates, don't you? And how do you how do you begin doing something like that? That's a fun topic. Yeah. Um, on the one hand, if you look from Microsoft's perspective, suppose that you are a 5,000 user enterprise and you buy a 2,000 user enterprise. Microsoft still only has 7,000 Office 365 licenses, whether those are all consolidated into a single tenant or not. So they don't really have a lot of incentive to help make it easier for you because you're, you're paying for them. Um, it's also the case that when you commit to buy 365 licenses, that's for a term of time. And so suppose that your license doesn't expire until you know, January 30th, 2021, you have already paid for and you're already committed to pay for those licenses. It's like leasing a flat. Yeah. When you commit to the lease, it doesn't matter if you live there or not, you're still you know, obligated to continue to pay. Um, and so trying to figure out, okay, what's the most efficient way for me to get the best value out of this pool of licenses that may span multiple tenants can really be difficult. Now, I don't want it to sound like I'm, I'm you know, being unfair to Microsoft. They do, in fact, have programs where you can go to them and say, well, we're doing this migration. We would like to move these licenses from here over to here. They do have ways to do that, but it's, it's all completely manual and it's completely negotiable. Yeah. So you really have to have a good rapport with Microsoft and be able to articulate why you want to do the thing that you are asking them for. And right. um, the answer may be no. Yeah. And I think, uh, to step back from that, that, that four-dimensional game of chess for a second, I mean, there's three ways. You'll know when you've got trouble, apart from you well, face, ho facing hopefully. the complexity, when, if and when you start, there's three ways. One of those is like when you start, you're realizing you're paying too much. And one of those things can be just having unused licenses hanging around. You know, right. You've overspec basically, aren't you? I mean, how much do you see that occurring and what kind of, I suppose, what, what's the most expensive, have you seen a really expensive eye-watering cases where people are paying too much without having all these licenses that aren't getting used? Oh, it's, it's routine. And so one of the things Microsoft is really focused on in their 2020 fiscal year, which just started in July, they're really focused on trying to make people use Microsoft Teams. Mm -hmm. And the way that they do that is for partners, for enterprise, um, their, their enterprise system integrators, they set really high utilization targets so that partners don't get paid unless they can drive 100, 150, 200% year over year adoption. Mm. And the reason they're doing that is customers look at the amount of the check that they had to write for the licenses and they're saying, wait a minute, I'm only using email. I'm not using OneDrive. I'm not using SharePoint. I'm not using Teams. Why should I keep paying this? Maybe I could use G Suite. Mm. Maybe I could just downgrade to a less expensive exchange online only license since I'm not using these things anyway. Well, what Microsoft is rather is they would rather poke you into getting you to use those things. Mm -hmm. And that has a side benefit for the enterprise. Those services have value, mm -hmm. right? They can make a, a measurable and significant difference in your productivity, your user capabilities. But Microsoft realizes that if you don't see the value, you won't be willing to pay yeah. for the value. And so they're trying to get people to um, start using those workloads and take advantage of them so they get habituated to the idea that, yeah, I am paying X dollars per user per month, but that's okay because look at everything I get. I've got yeah. you know, collaborative co-editing and uh, conferencing in teams and so on. And so until they can get people to make that jump and start yeah. using the things, and they have a, a tough battle. So they're kind of almost like coming out and explaining ways for you to use this stuff rather than have those licenses hanging around. Right. I mean, suppose I sold you a pickup truck and you didn't. You decided you were never going to put anything in the back of it. Mm. And you came to me and you said, you know what, Paul, I don't want this pickup truck anymore. I'm going to you know, stop paying for it and uh, you're going to have to repossess it. I'm going to use a bicycle. Well, what I, I, my choices are, I can say, okay, I'm really sorry we couldn't do business and take the keys back. Or to say, let me show you all the cool things you can do with a pickup truck that maybe you didn't realize. Yeah. You can put your kids in it. You can put a camper on top of it. You can pull a boat. And maybe one of those things will get you to say, oh, you know, I could do, I've got a boat and right now I don't have a way to pull it. Great. That's kind of the conversation they're trying to stimulate there. So it's very much, there's always been that way. The business driver is obviously to get use of a product. Right. Um, and the other thing I suppose is, you know, you're in trouble when, um, when you get audited by Microsoft for either for overuse of their software, not having uh, a sign, you, you bought a license and you've got more, for example, more devices accessing it than you should have or, right. or more users accessing it than you should have. I and mean, how often do you see that? So this is one part that's really interesting because Microsoft has a long tradition of very vigorously auditing enterprises mm -hmm. for on-prem usage. In the cloud, it's a little different. So in the, the normal consumption model of pay-as-you-go, 
you can't assign licenses you don't have. So if you have a thousand users and you bought a thousand licenses, if you hire 200 more people, you have to buy licenses for them. You can't just dip into the pool and assign licenses to these people without giving Microsoft some money. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a very strong positive for them. You can't do what you could do with on-prem windows um, any longer. The flip side of that is that um, you have a degree of flexibility in terms of deciding which licenses you will give to people when, and there's really no penalty to move licenses around. So mm -hmm. I can say, right, today you have an E3 enterprise SKU because you're doing these things. And maybe you go on maternity leave and I downgrade you to a much less expensive license. Now that the E3 license is still there, it goes back in my pool mm -hmm. and I can now assign it to a new hire or assign it to someone who's come back from maternity leave or whatever. Uh, so there is, on the customer side, you have the opportunity to move people through the license pool mm -hmm. and put them at the level that makes sense to save you the most possible money. The other, other piece that I just think is fascinating, there are a lot of licensing restrictions that are in the license that have no technical enforcement. Mm -hmm. So as an example, technically you can use Outlook Mobile on a mobile device with on-premises exchange. The license does not allow you to do that, but there's no check that says, oh, wait a minute, Paul, that mailbox is on-prem. You can't do that. Right. Um, Microsoft at any moment could decide to audit device access and you know penalize people who are breaking that license term. They haven't. There are a number of other cases like that where if they wanted to start enforcing those terms, they could, but they, for whatever reason, have chosen not to do that at this point. And the problem is that that may mean you are not compliant with the license and just not realize it because there's no alert, there's no notification, yeah. there's no knock on the door telling you. Right, that's coming. Um, and I suppose that behind all this is just the sheer complexity. Um, you know you're in trouble when you've got a stack of licenses. I mean, you mentioned there using the license when someone goes on return to leave, for example, and reassigning it. But we're all busy. I mean, who's got time to go, oh, she's gone, uh, or even paternity leave, I'll, I'll cycle that license around. I mean, rather, they just go and then the license sits there gathering dust. Really, exactly. It? The only plausible way to solve that is with automation. For yeah. any reasonable size enterprise, if you are doing manual license assignments, you're doing yeah. it wrong. Um, and I say that Microsoft has got some simple license automation tools included in the platform. Yeah. But Part of the reason that we have been so successful with our cloud platform is we give people more flexible ways to say, right, mm -hmm. if you are a user in the sales division in the UK, you automatically get this license. And when someone moves into that role, they get the license. When they move out of the company, they lose the license. If they move to a different role, say in sales in Germany, they get the license that's appropriate for that job role. Okay. That's the, the only feasible way to do it. So I think uh, it's just before we get into some, some uh, sort of detailed questions, it'd be, it'd be worth kind of, I suppose, setting some scene. Um, what do you think? We mentioned the different uh, product components of Office 365. What do you see? Obviously, there's a whole, there's the, you know, you've got a lot of options in there. What are you seeing customers using the most popular, um, commonly used aspects of Office 365? I mean, you mentioned the push on Teams right now. Right. Are you seeing that great uptake or is that all coming from Redmond? Obviously, the collaboration side, I presume, Word, Excel, are just giving people want that stuff. But what are the other component pieces in Office 365 that you're seeing people really going for these days, customers? Well, so, so everybody's got email, right? That's yeah. Microsoft sort of jokingly has described email as a gateway drug to the cloud because that's what gets people to move to the cloud in the first place, the economies of scale that come from getting rid of your on-prem mail. And then once you're there, um, Teams almost sells itself. The business value behind being able to quickly get ad hoc groups of people together to collaborate very quickly in a very rich environment is super powerful. Um, now, with that said, part of the reason people are doing that is because Microsoft has been making so much uh, smoke and noise mm. about how great Teams is. But the truth of the matter is, it you know, once people start using it in the business, the value emerges very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of a self-organizing value generator when people start to use it for the things that it can do. Mm -hmm. So Teams and Office's email, obviously. And most popular licenses, where are you seeing the majority of the market? I mean, you mentioned E3 and E5, I think. Are they where people are really at these days? For, for the most part, yeah. And part of the reason for that is that the new, newer Microsoft 365 SKUs are still, there, there are a lot of people out there who are still in the term of their yeah. E3 or E5s. When those come up for renewal, um, Microsoft is doing what they always do, and they're trying to make the newest SKUs more attractive by adding stuff. So as an yeah. example, the Windows Defender uh, Advanced Threat Protection, that is a fantastic tool. 
It really is. There's, there's no equal to it in the, the uh, endpoint antivirus space. But you can only get it if you buy the M365 SKUs. And the problem with that is then you are paying for a Windows 10 SKU that you may already have paid for through another route. And that's part of the reason why that, that slope has slowed. Mm -hmm. But Microsoft is going to continue to shovel things into that top-end SKU to get people to step up to it when renewal time comes. Okay. So let's take this again, some, I suppose, some a couple of questions. What are you seeing sure. as based on, you obviously deal with a lot of customers, um, people say things different ways, but you can boil these down to kind of half dozen, I suppose, core questions you keep coming up. Uh, I suppose the obvious one is, what are the most common risks, pitfalls or misunderstandings people have with Office 365, the top one or two that you can think of? Wow. Okay, so probably the top two are that, number one, you can manage everything effectively using only the tools that come from Microsoft, right? That's, that's a big pitfall that people run into is mm -hmm. they're accustomed to being able to use the on-prem tools that they're familiar with to manage everything. And the fact of the matter is there are some things that Microsoft doesn't want you to see or manage. Um, and it's a difficult transition for people to wrap their head around is that there are some things that are behind the blue curtain mm -hmm. that are not visible to the tenant administrator, can't be changed, can't be monitored. Um, the second biggest one probably is the difficulty and importance of change management because Microsoft continually, I mean, there's, you know, an army of engineers and developers are working on putting new features into mm -hmm. Office 365. Very common scenario is that Microsoft will post a, a notice in the public roadmap, which many people don't read, mm -hmm. if I'm honest, that says, we're going to start turning this feature on. Well, because it's so such a large service, there are 170 million plus users in the service. So when they say they're starting to roll it out, you don't know when you're going to get it. And two tenants that are in the same city of the same size, one might get it today and one might not get it for another three or four months. So you don't know exactly when these features are going to arrive. Very often when the features do arrive, they are turned on by default. So users all of a sudden see stuff popping up. They see a yeah. new button or a new client or something that worked one way now works a different way. And it's very difficult to stay in front of that and communicate to users and to the other stakeholders in the business. Microsoft is going to change this thing. Here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to be prepared for. Here's what to do if you have a problem. Because as you said, everybody's busy. Yeah. Right? Nobody has time to monitor the roadmap line by line and say, oh, look, Microsoft is going to do this thing. Um, and even if you did have time to do that, because you don't know when it's going to reach you, it's really difficult to sort of outrun that tsunami. It is. Um, the next question, I guess you get this kind of uh, at a very general level. You get what's the cost to me, um, me the enterprise? What is the the cost to a uh, customer and enterprise of Office three six five? Is it possible to quantify the cost? Can you come up with a number? I mean, everyone's it's like a, everyone's different, aren't they? They are. I mean, one simple way to say it is how much money do you have budgeted for software and give it to Microsoft? Mm. Right? That's a simple <laughs> way to do it. But if you think about the cost, right, on the, the credit side of the ledger, you have the on-prem things that you can dispose of that you no longer need um, or that you can repurpose so that they're not a cost for collaboration, identity management, the other things that are included in 365. The typical way that I tell people to estimate it is in your home territory, whatever country or geography you operate in, look at what the monthly standard cost is for an E3 or E5 if you just bought one. So mm -hmm. if you went to the site and plugged in your credit card, you bought yourself one license, what would that cost per month? That's the ceiling, mm -hmm. right? Microsoft will never charge more than that. But if you're an enterprise, you're buying thousands or tens of thousands of these, um, you could probably get a better deal than that. So you can't accurately estimate what that floor will look like because again, I could go to Microsoft and say, right, I want you to give me your absolute rock bottom price on office SKUs and they will, but then they will cut my software assurance uh, term or change a cost of something else yeah. that I'm buying. So the total amount of money that I pay to Microsoft will be different, even yeah. though the office cost may have, have gotten lower. Yeah, There's a reason why Gartner and some of the, why there are companies that do nothing but provide consulting services to enterprises to help them figure out what they're really spending. Yeah, Because boy, Microsoft does not make it easy. They don't, no. And that's why you have people in the company just dedicated to looking at Microsoft licenses and other and, enterprise licenses. And aren't you glad that's yeah. not your job? I'm very glad, yeah. Boy, that would be tough. But then there was a piece of software that could help me. So what we do in Quadratech's Nova platform is we let you plug in what you're paying for licenses. Yeah. The reason for that is we don't know 
exactly what your licenses cost. What we can tell you is if you tell us how much they cost, mm -hmm. we can tell you, are you getting value? Because we know whether the licenses are being used or not. Mm -hmm. So if you sit down to our license cost analyzer and say, right, I have 10,000 E3s and 4,000 E5s. We can look and tell you how many idle licenses you have. We can tell you for individual workloads, hey, you have 700 people who have E3s but only use email. Well, those are great candidates to move to a less expensive license. Yeah. You have 7,000 users who have this license level and are uh, you know, have multi-licenses, we call them. So maybe they bought E3 and they've also bought Power BI. Mm -hmm. Well, that might be an opportunity for you to bundle that at the Microsoft level next time you renew and say, look, we want you to throw in these Power BI licenses or we want you to give us a discount on a SKU that includes everything that people are using. And I suppose another, another good question, and this must come up a lot, is... Um, can can I the enterprise or this customer in front of me? Can I mix my enterprise licenses on the same the same tenant? Is that possible? Sure. People that, that might still let you do that. So you can mix. You actually can, although almost nobody does. You can mix the business premium and enterprise SKUs within a single tenant. Right. Uh, there's really no advantage to doing that. It's technically possible. I don't think it's really intended, but you could do it. But it's very common for people to have a mix of E5, E3, Microsoft 365 SKUs and then single workload SKUs. So for example, I might take someone who has um, E3 and also buy them a Power BI mm -hmm. Pro license. That's pretty common for people who are you know, analytics heavy mm -hmm. in say the finance department. They might not need the other features that come in an E5, but they might do enough Power BI work to require that Pro license. Yeah. So they make it, I was gonna say they make it easy, uh, in the same way that you can go to a, you know, a buffet restaurant uh, and get a little of this and a little of that, they make it very easy for you to do that in terms of acquiring the licenses. They make it very difficult in terms of knowing what you're paying for. It would be as though you went to the buffet and without realizing it, every time you take a piece of sweet and sour chicken, that costs uh, you know 10 cents. But every time you take a piece of the pepper chicken next to it, that's actually 45 cents. Mm. And it's not marked, so you don't know until you go to the uh, the exit and pay your bill. Yeah. And what do you think? Is, is it possible? Is it cheaper to buy an E3? with add-ons or an E5 license? It depends on the add-ons and it depends on whether you're going to use all the add-ons, yeah. right? It also depends on whether Microsoft is feeling like giving you a good deal on the E5 because you're buying some other things at the same time. So it's list price versus knowing your, your rep in a way, isn't it? Your... Well, it, it, it sort of is, right? I mean, you can look at the list price, but also if I go to Microsoft and say, you know what, I, I have this giant data warehouse where I use SQL very extensively. Um, so I need to buy SQL Server Enterprise Edition 2019, which is, extremely expensive, yeah. right? I don't think that's a secret to anybody. If you're going to spend $2 million in SQL licenses, you can probably get them to give you a bit of a break on the E5s. Yeah. On the other hand, if you're only buying E5 licenses because you use Oracle or because you use MySQL or some other database technology, well, maybe they don't give you such a good deal. They're not gonna look so favorably on you, are they? Well, it makes perfect sense for them to figure out, okay, how much total money can we extract yeah. from this customer and try to do it in a way that maximizes their, you know, their profit? You certainly can't blame them for that. That's what they're in business for. Yeah. And I suppose um, Microsoft 365 license versus Office 365 license, is there a difference? Do you get more value from one or the other? That's a really tough question because that's where, you know, one of the big advantages of the cloud was supposed to be it's evergreen. You never have to upgrade. Yeah. Well, that ignores the fact that we still have hardware, right? Most enterprises are not yet fully into bring your own device. And so if you imagine that you've got an enterprise where you have laptops and desktops that belong to the company that have some kind of Windows license on them, M365 makes a lot of sense if you want to be able to perpetually keep those devices updated to the latest version of Windows. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the whole reasoning behind that SKU. But if you have devices that you bought, say, within the last two or three years that are already on Windows 10, they're already up to date, buying another Windows 10 license to put on those things probably doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, where I see that coming in the future is that working with the device OEMs, Microsoft has got to come up with a model where you buy a bunch of hardware from Dell or HP or Lenovo or whoever your preferred vendor is. And then instead of buying a Windows license from the OEM, which is just buying it from Microsoft anyway, you just buy the device and then buy all of the software license from the OS all the way up through the collaboration stack from Microsoft. I think that's sort of where they would like that model to go. We'll see if the OEMs want to play ball. Yeah, it's always interesting what the OEMs do and the partners. And uh, what's the cheapest way to get an Office 365 license? Well, that's a good question. Um, 
marry somebody at Microsoft. That's <laughs> always a popular. You know, the, the least expensive way for most people is going to be to work through what Microsoft calls a CSP, yeah. right, or a, a licensing provider. And that's because they buy it wholesale and they have more pricing flexibility than you'll get if you go straight to the portal. So the most expensive way to do it is to go to the Microsoft portal in your country and click the Buy Office 365 button, right? That, that's the worst possible way to do it. Um, the absolute cheapest is probably going to be a CSP unless you have such a large enterprise agreement or such a large relationship mm. that you can uh, turn the screws on Microsoft and get yeah. them to give you a bigger price break, but that's hard to do. So go to the channel, find channel partners. Generally, that's going to be your best bet. Yeah. And on the, license, on the mobile aspect, um, when do you need a, a, a license for Outlook Mobile? So you need a license for Outlook Mobile if you want to use it to access your cloud mailbox, but that's included in the E3, E5, mm. uh, P1, all of those licenses. Um, I'm going to be brutally honest and say I don't understand what the rules are for using the Office applications for mobile. It used to be you could read documents without having to have a license, but you had to have a license if you wanted to edit documents. I think that's still the case, and I think now that's enforced by this, you know, this, the application will not let you edit a document if you're not logged into an account that has a license. But I could be completely wrong about that. And this, one of the pitfalls that I want to point out, make sure everybody understands, the only real source of truth for what is or is not permitted with the Microsoft licenses is what the license says. Yeah. Um, some people understand it more than others. I feel like I have sort of a layman's understanding even after a long time in this business. Um, but it's easy to make mistakes because Microsoft does not always make it obvious what you can and can't do with any given license. Okay. So I think the last two questions, we can probably jump into something you, you've, uh, Quadratech has been working on, which is Nova. And one is, how do I track what I'm spending on licenses? And if we, you, I know you're ready to answer that question. And uh, how do I know if I've got the right licenses assigned to the right people? So uh, I suppose at a conceptual level, how can you do that? And where does kind of Nova kind of come into that as well? So one of the things Nova does, you know, if I had more time, we'd talk about the five value pillars of Nova and all the good stuff that I'm more than happy to talk about at length. But the key thing to think about Nova is that it's all based on reporting analytics that we gather from the service. So we know what licenses you have in your pool. We know who they're assigned to. We know whether people are using those licenses, and if so, which workloads, or which sub-licenses they're using. So I can tell that Emma, my marketing manager, is using Teams. I know how many Teams calls and Teams chats and Teams meetings she's having. Meanwhile, I know that uh, Rostislav, one of my developers, also has a Teams license, but he never conducts meetings. I mean, he's a developer. Why would he? So driven by that, I can start to put together a picture of, okay, here's how much total I'm spending on licenses because I know how many licenses I have allocated. Here's where licenses are underused. So I've got a license assigned to someone who's not using it at all. Maybe the account's been inactive for a certain period of time. Maybe they're using part of the license, but not another part. And then I can start to use that to shape automatic license assignments. So I can say, right, I'm going to take this person or this group of people who are not using the licenses I have, and I'm going to automatically move them to a less expensive license. And of course, because of the way Microsoft's pool works, the minute I take the unused licenses away, they go back in the pool that I can then automatically assign mm -hmm. to new people who do need those licenses. Right. So you can you do a lot of very detailed granular tracking in, in right. that software. And are there any other kind of, uh, I suppose, standout features you think are worth pointing out? And what would the alternative, if you weren't using uh, something like Nova, you'd be what, different products you'd be relying on, you know, uh, Microsoft's own features in Office 365, spreadsheets, where would you be in this? You out there with a Zippo somewhere? You know, people have built these enormously complicated, error-prone, fragile PowerShell scripts to try to automate licensing. And that's great as long as the person who wrote the script is still at the company. Yeah. Um, there, there's a lot of, Microsoft talk, likes to talk about citizen developers, right? Which are people who are not formally trained yeah. software developers who build line of business applications. And that's a great example. There are all kinds of um, homegrown solutions that try to solve parts of the problem. Microsoft's approach has been We'll give you a tool where if you put someone into an Active Directory group, you can specify what license that group member gets. And as long as you move people into and out of groups the right way, okay, fine, that, that's usable. But it only scratches the surface of what you can do because they're only focusing on the piece of making sure that Gavin has the right license or that Emma has the right license. They're not thinking about how do I know whether the right license is 
assigned based on what that user does and what it's costing the company. They're only thinking about, okay, you want this person to have an E3, I want to make sure they get an E3. We're focused on helping you decide, should that person have an E3? Should they have an E5? Should they have some add-ons? Um, because Microsoft you know, doesn't have any tooling at all for that. And how kind of customizable, I suppose, is, is Nova in that um, every enterprise is different. You're not simply supplying a set of rules out of the box. People can, can uh, tailor it to their own set. Of- well, they have to. We don't provide any rules out of the box because, as you say, every enterprise is different. We don't know what license assignment policies you're going to yeah. want in your enterprise, uh, which is why we give you a very flexible tool set to build policies that mm. enforce the rules that you want to enforce. How simple is it to build policies? People might think, oh, I don't want to go into policies, and that might, that's someone else's job. So you pick a group of people, and when I say group, it can be a group, it can be an OU, it can be domain members, it can be something built with a filter. So you pick a set of people and you say, I want people who match this description to get this license. And we automatically monitor when someone pops in and matches that description and they didn't before, they get the license. When they no longer fit that description, they no longer get it. And we talked about how traditionally you would have either expert, a team of people who deal with this stuff. Who could use this kind of feature then? Is it the dev guy? Is it the head of the department? Who, who would this be aimed at? So we try to automate it so that nobody has to do anything. So the IT team would normally set up the licensing flow because they're the ones, you know, at the end of the day, the IT folks are the ones whose heads will roll when they spend too much money on licenses yeah. or when things are not allocated right. So they set up the license flows to say, right, when someone joins the sales team, they get this license. When someone joins the marketing team, they get that license. Except if they happen to be in Switzerland, they also get this other license because business reasons. Okay. Uh, once that's set up, then the rest of it's automated. So the department head, the HR team, the individual users have to do nothing. Okay. So kind of coming to the end of our time, I suppose, if you had to make two action action recommendations for people, um, what would they be? I mean, I'm kind of think it's regularly review uh, your, your usage of licenses. And I suppose Nova is kind of one, one way of helping you achieve that. Could you well, I mean, my first call to action would be to tell everybody to go out and buy Nova, but that's pro- probably not super helpful Obviously. in this context. So um, the, the really important thing to keep in mind for enterprises is you're always on the clock. Mm. So your enterprise agreement or your, your open value agreement, whatever agreement you have to buy those licenses has got a term. You can't wait until the end of the term mm. to decide what you're going to do, because if you do, you're the pressure is going to be enormous for you just to repeat what you did last time. Mm-hmm. And that may not be the most cost effective thing to do. So at least six months out, you should be looking very carefully at how your licenses are allocated, what you're spending, what your office spend is as a portion of your total Microsoft license spend, and figure out if you're on the right track. Do you yeah. have the right licenses? Are they assigned to the right people? Are you spending the appropriate amount of money for the value you're getting? Mm-hmm. So that when the time comes to negotiate with Microsoft, you have some data. If you just go in and you don't have that data, then they're going to sell you whatever they think they can get away with selling you. And that's what's really important is having that data, being able to support your arguments. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul. That was great. I think we've covered a lot of technical ground there. We've well covered the four-dimensional chessboard, I think. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, yes, it's been great you. having you here. And um, if you want to catch up with this special Register Quadratech uh, webcast anytime, I believe it's available on site. It is. It is. And uh, enjoy your leisure. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Uh, My pleasure, Gavin. Thank Thank you. you.